Please welcome to the stage University of Colorado Boulder graduate and professional student government executive, Bara Peak, and undergraduate student government tri-executive, Rachel Hill. Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for this panel discussion, Developing Climate Solutions with the Human Rights of Future Generations in Mind. What do youth have to say about that? My name is Bara Peek, and I'm an Earth History Geologist and PhD candidate here at CU, in addition to my role within student government. And my name is Rachel Hill. I am a senior here at CU Boulder, and I currently serve as one of our tri-executives for CU student government. Many youth and others have claimed the rights of future, future generations in the face of climate change. This panel will explore how global society, including governments, should factor in the human rights of future generations in developing solutions to climate change, especially from the perspective of youth. It will also focus on how to effectively tap into the energy, enthusiasm, and strong level of social networking of youth to help ensure that climate change activities are sustainably organized at the community level, including in schools, as well as globally. We're here today in our capacity as student leaders to highlight some of the work being done by CU students, both graduate and undergraduate, in the realms of addressing climate change and human rights. Within the grad student government, our primary goal is to empower students to advocate for themselves and engage and contribute to their local campus and broader Colorado communities. We believe strongly in the right to education and that education should be as inclusive and equitable as possible. Advocating for increased financial aid and more affordable education for all students, especially those from historically marginalized backgrounds, is a key piece of these efforts. As has been a common theme throughout the summit so far, the problems presented by climate change requires everyone to be involved in the solutions, and this is only possible if our institutions are accessible to all. Within the Boulder and Colorado Front Range communities, CU students are leaders in efforts to reduce emissions and consumption. CU Boulder was the first university to establish a recycling program, which has more recently expanded to include composting across campus. Students are champions of public transportation in the state, writing op-eds calling for increased funding, as well as working with local community groups to increase uh, the efficiency and effectiveness of non-automobile transportation systems. And in the CU student government, we are also advocating to upper levels of administration and even on the regent level to use sustainable building practices in things such as our CU South agreement, as well as supporting fossil-free CU in divesting from fossil fuels on a system level. CUSG is in the process of drafting a resolution that would support fossil-free CU and their mission for divestment. We will now turn things over to the panel moderator, Elena Sanchez Nicolas. Sanchez Nicolas covers institutional affairs, climate change, energy, and tech policy for EU Observer. Before joining EU Observer, she worked on European affairs at the Brussels-based think tank, Vote Watch Europe, and the Spanish news agency, EFE. Based in Brussels, she is originally from Spain and serves as the acting president for the Association of European Journalists Belgium. Sanchez Nicolas holds a master's degree in new media and society in Europe from the Vrea Université Brussels and a master's in transmedia journalism from the Universidad Nacional de Educación a Distancia in Madrid. Please join us in welcoming Elena to the stage. Thank you, everyone. Um, it's an honor to be here and to be uh, in one of the closing panels of this event. Um, it has been such an inspiring experience to hear all the expertise from the panelists that have taken the floor uh, so far in, in, in this uh, event. And I hope you can also feel inspired by our four panelists today. Um, as you know, you can submit questions through the app. We will try to take them uh, later today. And it is my pleasure to introduce you to first Iwi Stephanie Lama, who is the Director of Programming of the Pan-African Center for Climate Policy. She has been almost a decade working as an environment and climate justice advocate in rural communities of Cameroon, particularly in, uh, for women and young people. Um, she works directly with youth 
uh, through her weekly radio program, Eco Voices, and she heads a team that has developed a climate change curriculum and a team of volunteers in Cameroon. She is also a mentor for the Africa Climate Reality Project, and she gained recognition from the United Nations Foundation as one of the six new youth voices on climate change. She is also a UN Peace Ambassador. Welcome, Evie. We also have Julieta Martinez. She is the founder of Tremendas. It's a global action proof platform uh, that was originated in Chile, uh, but now it's present in, uh, in 20 countries around the world. She has also co-founded Latinas for Climate and the Education Academy Climaticas. Her work focuses primarily in uh, girls' education as climate solution and gender issues related to climate change. She is currently directing her first documentary, focusing on girls as part of developing solutions to climate change and as well as calls to action from the Global South. Welcome, Julieta. Then we have Hilda Flaviana Cabulle, who you already know from uh, Friday's panel. She is the founder of Fridays for Future Uganda, the well-known global climate strike movement, um, where, where she is like a climate, uh, gender, and environmental rights activist for, for years. Um, she has visited uh, several uh, schools around the world, mobilizing students and young people to raise their voices to make a difference. Um, she's also a public speaker and a writer. She has taken place in uh, uh, taking part in, in international conferences. And she also leads the efforts to clean up the source of Lake Victoria, empowering lake shore communities to learn to protect the lake and to fight against pl plastic pollution. Welcome, Hilda. <laughs> Then we also have another panelist, uh, Monica, a new partner, who is joining us online um, from Nepal. She is the program officer for the Center for Environment Education in Nepal. She's an environment educator and a climate activist uh, who has studied environmental science. She's also the president of Climate Nepal and has worked as a young climate consultant as, at UNICEF Nepal. Since 2018, she has been volunteering for several NGOs and organizing events on climate change, uh, climate action, and youth activism. Um, she has won awards at innovation competition, including Unleash Hacks in uh, 2020. Welcome, Monica. <laughs> so I, I would like to, to kick off the panel by asking you to, to tell us more about your climate journey, you know, like what motivated you to, to, to really start engaging with young people, uh, women, uh, and others um, into uh, engaging in climate action. Monica, maybe, do, do you want to start uh, with this question? Uh, yeah, hello everyone, namaste. Uh, my name is Monica, I'm from joining from Nepal. And it is a great, great honor for me to be like uh, getting this platform to speak and share about my climate journey. So since uh, like uh, I studied um, environment science in my bachelor's degree, I like came across uh, to know more about how climate change and how this crisis is like coming up and how the future generations are in danger. So like usually in context of Nepal, we are not like you know taught about all these issues. Uh, um, like when we are young. So yeah, I was like, uh, in 2018, when I completed my bachelor's degree, like I was, um, you know, feeling the pressure that we need to act and we need to, you know, uh, like protect this planet for the future generations. And since then I've been advocating, I've been like raising awareness about how uh, climate change is affecting and how like Nepal being the most vulnerable country, um, like where people live closely to nature are being affected due to different consequences of climate change. So since then, like I have been advocating through different policy making, through different, you know, activism works and uh, such as global, I participated in global climate strike. I try to, you know, like work in a way uh, where I can, you know, in one hand, I can raise awareness in the communities, in the, um, you know, like 
uh, young people uh, raise awareness among young people through education through um, awareness and also try to you know uh, like put that voices in the policy making through advocacy by engaging in advocacy work uh, like with discussion like uh, by discussing and lobbying with different policy makers and to you know share the stories of the local communities that i uh, work uh, while while i am working um, with the schools and with the uh, young people. So yeah, like since 2018, I have been working with different youth-led NGOs, for example, Climates Nepal, Harin Nepal. So there are a lot of NGOs and a lot of youth who uh, you know, are actively engaged to aware and for advocacy work here in Nepal. So I have been participating in different uh, climate strikes with a local agenda, which are more relevant to our country. And also apart from that, I have been leading a project named uh, project-based learning, which is which mainly aims to educate young generations. Like we target uh, and we work with school children to uh, you know make them aware about how climate change and how environmental uh, education is necessary. Uh, we teach them to develop you know problem-solving ideas and projects that are related to the, like finding the solutions of all the uh, problems which they can lead in their community for climate adaptation and mitigation. So yeah, that's uh, that's some of the uh, background work that I'm doing. And also I got an opportunity to work with, um, you know, um, different policies like through uh, UNICEF Nepal, I got chance to lobby, um, you know, like national level um, policies that uh, uh, like that are like actually um, in the books but not implemented so we had you know we have a coordination team that works uh, coordination team of youth that works to lobby uh, you know uh, different policies and you know to include the youth's voices um, in the policy making so yeah that's so far that i have been working um, now and like i am motivated to work in this because you know i have I represent a community which is highly vulnerable in context of climate change. And since my childhood, I've seen a lot of uh, issues that were directly linked because of climate change. And, you know, I was not aware when I was young, but now I feel that I am aware about it and I should act uh, like according um, like whatever I can do, I should act now. So yeah, that's uh, how I have been, you know, uh, engaged in climate activism and advocacy. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, maybe Hilda, you, do you want to, to, to tell us more about, yeah, what motivated you to, to take on this career on climate activism? Yeah, uh, thank you. So I uh, will share my story. I come from a farmer's village in the basin of Lake Victoria in Uganda, a country that British once called the Pearl of Africa. My country uh, faces the worst effects of climate change. It's the 12th most vulnerable country to climate change. And yet we contribute less than 1% of the global gas emissions. And 13 years ago, my family owned one of the biggest uh, farm or plantations in our village. And due to the effects of climate change, my farm was devastated because of the rising temperatures, the heavy rains, the strong winds. And my family couldn't afford to live because we couldn't, we weren't earning anything from the farm. So my grandmother had to sell off part of our land so that we could buy food from the town. And when the money was over, it was a question of survival and death. I remember I had to miss school for months because my parents couldn't afford to pay my tuition fees. And this is the time when other people were attending school. And during this time, my grandmother I had my grandmother weep in her room about why the gods were cursing us because our farm, which was a source of income, was devastated. As a child, I couldn't understand what was going on because we were not taught climate change in school. So I didn't have an answer for why she was crying. But she told me that she was crying because the gods were punishing us and that's why they, they devastated our farm. And as time went on, I realized that uh, climate change is there. And this was during uh, 
a discussion that was held at my school, that was university, and the speaker was talking about climate change and the role that youth play in combating, in combating climate change. And that was the first time I really heard uh, that climate change is real and it was the reason as to why my family's land was devastated. And when I got this education about climate change, I took it upon myself. I took on the responsibility to spread the information that I had got to other people so that they know. And I started with my classmates, with, uh, I, I went on to the streets, I went on to the communities that are greatly impacted. And since then we've been creating a lot of climate awareness. So my education gave me the knowledge and confidence to start Fridays for Future Uganda. It's a student and youth led movement and we do a lot of climate action with communities. We work with communities on ground. Uh, for now we have 72 communities uh, that are greatly impacted by the effects of climate change. Uh, we create climate awareness in schools, uh, on the streets, Definitely anywhere, we could just find you on the way and tell you about climate change, so you either slap us <laughs> or listen to us. And uh, that's what we've been trying to do, creating awareness. We also lead campaigns on, uh, for example, we are fighting a big French company, Total Energies, that is yet to construct the world's uh, most uh, largest heated crude oil pipeline, the East African crude oil pipeline. It will be 1,104, 1, sorry, 1,445 kilometers long, and it has already displaced about 200,000 people. It's passing through 178 villages in two countries, and people have already lost their land, their livelihoods, their culture and tradition. So we are fighting against this crude oil pipeline project so that people can get back their land, so that they can get back their farming grounds. And I was kicked out of school uh, because of the effects of climate change, but I'm not the only one. Every year, four million girls are kicked out of school because of the effects of climate change. That's four million daughters and sisters whose potential is cut short. That is why we bear the biggest responsibility as women and girls because we are affected most by climate change. And that is why we are working with women communities to make them aware that they bear the biggest burden and they have to play a very big role in you know, creating a future for their children, for the children after them, and uh, you know, for the other generations to come. Thank you. Well, Julieta, I know your work is also very focused on girls and, and women. Can you tell us a little bit about your story? Absolutely, and every time I hear Hilda's story or amazing activist story, it's we literally live an ocean away and there's so many fears and dreams and needs to act that we share. So um, I need to start by saying thank you so much for being here. Not only to listen to youth, but youth coming from one of the countries most affected by the effects of this crisis. Because we need you to get, a, get to actual tangible solutions. So, um, so my name is Julieta, I'm from Chile, Santiago. I'm 19 at the moment. And I started getting really interested in, in climate action, actually not climate action, but innovation at it when I was 10. Um, I suffered something that lots of kids suffer at school, unfortunately, that I was bullying. I was going through physical bullying, uh, psychological bullying, cyber bullying. I, I got a little bit of everything. <laughs> and I remember feeling so alone. Have you ever feel in this, this feeling of being in a room with 50 people, but still you have nobody that shares the same interest at all? You, know, you don't have a safe place. So I needed to find a comfort zone. I needed to find a safe place, and that's how I came uh, I, I started learning about innovation, entrepreneurship, and activism, especially connected to sustainability. My mom is a great innovator. She loves everything that uh, it's about changing the world, even if it sounds, cl it sounds cliche, it sounds out of a Disney movie. What can we do as civil society? What can you do, a private sector, public sector government, to get to an actual solution 
not just empower women, because that's a really important part, of course, but we normally just stay in that part. Like, you're powerful, so then what? What can I do? Where's, where are the tools or action mechanisms? How can I get involved in, in law projects, public policy, et cetera? So I started learning about this. And I started getting really into sustainability, and I came up with a concept that I don't know if you're familiar with it. Sorry. <laughs> that it's sacrifice zone. Have you heard that before? Could you raise your hand if you heard the word or the concept sacrifice zone before? All right. So it's this are, are pretty common in, in Chile, but mostly in Latin America. That's basically a place that is the focus point for a lot of industries. So the everything is absolutely destroyed. The water is polluted, the air is polluted, and there's people living in it. You find girls that are younger than me, You're, I'm talking about 13-year-old girls, 14-year-old girls that are, are not thinking about going to university, I'm not thinking about going to college, they're thinking, I'm gonna get lung cancer by the time I get to be 20 or 30. My grandfather got, got cancer, my father got cancer, and then it's my turn. And, and I remember starting to, trying to work in territory, like get out of cyber activism and get to actually meet this, those girls. Because yeah, I'm Latin America, but I live in the capital. I live in Santiago. That's a whole different reality. And I understood that, that I needed to do something, that I needed to get out of my comfort zone. So and to keep it short, because if Chileans are good with something, it's talking about themselves. <laughs> <laughs> um, I decided that I wanted to, make something tangible. So I created a platform called Tremendas. It's kind of like Tremendous in English, but I actually don't know if there's a specific way to translate it. Uh, this was basically to amplify the works of young people, especially young women, uh, that are really powerful, but they don't actually know how to get to an actual solution or how to connect with the local government. Uh, I focus on education, everything that's about STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, climate action, gender equality, like things that could ch actually change your life. That's what I always say that girls' education is a climate solution. In Chile and in different countries in South America, uh, you find girls that use around four hours, five hours of a day to get access to clean water, to get access to fuel instead of going to school. So science trying to get to a, a pattern, some, a, some sort of cycle that gets repeated over and over and over again. So there's a girl that doesn't go to school. If you don't go to school, you don't get to college. To get to college, you probably you're not going to get a job. You're not going to get a job, you don't get money. And you become dependent of a him. And you get kids when you're 15, not because you want to, because you have no choice. And you get married not because you want to, because you have no choice. And you get trapped. And it's over and over and over again. I understood that this is a climate crisis that has a woman's face and a girl's face as well. So I understood that that's what I wanted to do. And, uh, and just to finish with it, um, we normally went I started to get this, I started to get interviews. I don't know if you have gone through the same thing, but the first interview I got on TV to talk about all of this, to talk about COP and solutions, adaptation, mitigation, resilience. Do you know what the, was the first question I got? Julita, I love that you're talking about activism. So interesting. But um, doing, because of you're doing all of this, do you have time to date? <laughs> do you want to be a mother? The camera is right there. You cannot, go ahead, we're waiting for you. We're waiting for you. So if that happens to me, it happens all around the world. So it's, this is a work for women in leadership positions, for men that's hearing me right now, and for every single one of us. Yeah. Thank you, that was powerful. Iwi, do you want to tell us about? Yeah. yeah um, I think uh, before I talk about how I started, I would like to talk about where I am now. Please. Then I start. <laughs> so, uh, um, Eri Stephanie Lama. I'm from Limbe, Cameroon, in West Africa. Limbe is a touristic uh, count, uh, town in Cameroon. And where I am now, I think before I, before this bio was sent, 
after the bio was sent, um, I got the opportunity to go to COP for the first time. And at COP27, I was given an award, the UN Agora Award for my documentary, um, African Voices for Africa's Forest. Thank you. And I lost my dad when I was four years old. And at four years old, I saw my mom lost everything that she had. She lost all the lands my father had. And we had to move to the village because my father's family took away all the property, the land, and everything that my father owned. So we moved to the village and I was, I was four and my little sister was just nine months old. So my mom had to focus on the earth to make sure that we could survive. She went to the farm. I remember her staying in the forest for two weeks, one week, working on people's farms because we didn't have a land of her own. And she had to go into other people's farms to work. And she would stay the nights and days trying to make sure that when she returns, my little sister and I could have Christmas clothes. If you're from West Africa, you understand what Christmas clothes mean to us, very important. So when she returns, she will buy us the beautiful Christmas clothes in the village and make sure that we appeared the most beautiful kids in the village. And it happened that this uncle of us, of ours, who, who saw the situation that was happening within our village uh, and what we were going through, decided to take us to the small town of Limbe. And in Limbe, he left us to ourselves, and my mom had to turn back to the earth to survive. She rented a piece of land, too, and planted cassava, planted corn, and cocoa yams. And so those were what we had to we had so much staple that uh, we fed only on staples, had little proteins of vegetables and all that. Then as time went on, we realized that the house where we were staying was um, like a 10, not 10, a two by two meter square room where I had to stay with my mom. We didn't have water running, so we used to walk like five kilometers to get water that we needed to take care of our home, myself, my mom, and my little sister. And the lands we were benefiting from started reducing the, pro uh, the crop production that we were getting. So, but we kept managing on it until one day, the owners just, I don't know if they had a meeting, but they came and they decided to take away their lands. Our food was there and we didn't have anything. To, we couldn't go back to the lands. We didn't have anything to eat. So my mom decided to look at what skills she had and to focus on it. But keeping that aside, I grew up and I'd been seeing how she had been working with the earth because she, she kept telling us the earth is the only thing that can help you survive. And I grew up with that mindset and I grew up with a love for nature. I decided, I told myself, oh, I'm going to do science when I go to when I'm in high school. I got to high school, I focused on geology, and succeeded to pass my advanced level examinations in Cameroon, went on to uh, a ba the bachelor's degree, where I took in interest in geology with a minor in environmental science. I began understanding a little bit about nature, about the environment, and all uh, other things. Then, one day I rushed home and I told my mom, I want to be a politician. And she was like, where on earth did you come about with, with, with that? <laughs> what, what do you want to do with politics? <laughs> and in Cameroon, we know politics is a very crooked game. So she, <laughs> she asked me, how crooked do you want to be? <laughs> and I continued doing my, environment, my geology and environmental science. I graduated. One day, I was just walking the streets, and uh, a friend met me. She was like, hey, Amy, what are you doing? What after school? What are you doing? Are you doing anything? And I told her, no, I'm not doing anything. I'm just 
idle. I've gone around with tons of files, dropping my folders all over the place, looking for job applications, and, and nobody is giving me a job. So she said, my mom runs an organization. It's uh, around forestry. I don't know if you can come there and try to work. She might give you a job. And I was excited. I went home, put together my documents, went to the organization, and dropped my application. Then I was caught up. Hey, you have been taken. So I rushed home, but there was something behind that. I rushed home and told my mom, I now have a job. I'm working with an environmental organization. Only for me to be working there, this is 10 years counting, and I realized I was working as a volunteer. <laughs> So I've been working as a volunteer with this organization since 2013. And when I started working with this organization, I remember being involved in two main projects. One was on the new agrarian change, and the other one was on uh, agro, pastor, agro uh, plantations, uh, 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 expansion. So, um, so I was working as I was volunteering as uh, a research assistant in the fields that we had to work in. At that time, we had like 16 communities to work in, carrying out that research. It was, the research were two years intervals, and I went, while going to these communities, we had meetings with council members and all of that, and I began picking up some trends. People, some category, uh, category of people were missing in these meetings. We didn't have women, we didn't have young people, and I started asking myself questions, why are women not talking about land issues? Why are young people not talking about land issues? And then I came home one day and I told my mom, mom, I, I don't want to be a politician anymore, <laughs> but I want to influence poli policies. I want to influence policies and I have decided to influence policies around the environmental space. And she was like, hmm. It's as if that your school is teaching you well. That was the NGO she was calling my school. <laughs> she always called it a school because since I wasn't getting a salary, I was going every day and I had to, <laughs> I had to always ask her for transportation to go. So she was still taking care of me and everything. And then um, that is how I started working in forest resources and people until now. But in the course of volunteering, one of the things that has groomed me along the way has been my volunteering. In working with forest resources and people, I uh, got connected with the Pan-African Center for Climate Policy, where I am still volunteering. I am still volunteering forest resources and people in the Pan-African Center for Climate Policy. And then I was pushed by my coordinator at forest resources and people. Anyway, why don't you go do a master's? And I didn't know what I had to do a master's in. So I decided to go in and look at the programs at the University of Boya, and I realized there was a master's in um, natural resource and environmental management. So I went into that and focused and began reading a lot of documents, picking up information, and then that is, I knew exactly what I had to do. My mom had lost all the land she had when I was growing up because she was a woman. I mean, I even lost my father's name because my mom refused to get married to the people they wanted her to get married to. And because uh, 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 um, she was a woman, she lost all the farms she had paid money for. Hmm. And these farms were not even yielding what she was expecting because climate change had impacted our crop production. We had to go miles fetching water. And now I was doing a master's degree in natural resource and environmental management. I knew exactly what I had to do. I knew what I had to do. I had to be influence policies and promote women in rural communities to be able to go up to decision-making platforms and programs and make sure that their voices are heard and make sure that youth voices are heard. Discussions around environmental protection, around climate change involves them. And I took up a document on uh, a Red Plus project, that pilot project that were, was uh, uh, implemented in Cameroon, and I decided to read into that document. I identified some gaps within that document, which pushed me to developing my master's thesis. When I um, looked through uh, and investigated that report, 
I went back into the communities where this research was conducted, where the Red Plus program was conducted, and interviewed a few women. Were you involved in this project? And they said, no, they were not. Hmm. So out of over 100 women I interviewed, only four had heard of this project. And the reason they heard of the project was because they were married to Elite in the community. So every other person who was not married to an elite or didn't have a brother who was an elite did not know that this project existed. But there were reports and there were documents that showed that this project had been completed. Then I went to, I, I, I analyzed the results and took it to my supervisor and submitted to him. And you know what happened? My supervisor told me, you are going to do a different report. Just for me to find out he was part of the project. So he told me, you are going to start all over. This work you're doing was copied from someone in Congo. And I'm like, where did I? This project was not in Congo. The Red Plus program is actually what happened in Cameroon, which I just investigated. Mm -hmm. And now he brought, started bringing up a story. So I had to go to a, a female supervisor, a, a female lecturer and ask her, told her everything, and she stood in and she helped me to do my defense and graduate, the best student in my department as, uh, um, after defending that particular project. So since then, I've been working throughout, this is 10 years counting, and my focus has been on raising the voices of women to decision-making platforms around climate change, around natural resource management, around environmental protection, and mm -hmm. my tool has been nature-based solutions and arts. Let's dive a little bit deeper into that. As you, as you said, um, all of you have raised the point, uh, women face the greatest risk uh, and uh, the biggest burden um, from climate change. So how would you say, Monica, maybe uh, you want to start with it, how would you say like local communities and, and governments are addressing uh, gender issues related to climate change? Um, yeah, thank you so much um, for the So for me, like, uh, like uh, fortunately, I participated in COP27, and, like, what I saw there was, like, in the policy making, in the, like, you know, uh, table where the actual policy and the negotiations were happening, uh, there were like very less women participating and that is the fact that like it is one of the most important global conferences um, that needs to be you know like you know where the policy making is happening but like you know the representation uh, of women there uh, the representation of youth the representation of indigenous communities like are really low and like we have that like live uh, you know uh, you know, uh, evidence that like, you know, people, what, what policymakers, what elites do is just to include women in their like uh, speeches, in their like, you know, lip promises, but not in the policymaking table. And like Nepal uh, being one of the most vulnerable countries, what happens is you, women are one of the most impacted because they are the ones who are, who are like, you know, finding solutions in the communities who are actually facing the impacts of climate change. And, you know, like, while while they are one well, they are the ones who are affecting uh, we who are affected by climate change but not included in policy making we, uh, there are a lot of examples where women, women have uh, stepped forward and found solution for example uh, i i went through a uh, um, a report where uh, Bang in Bangladesh women developed uh, wind and flood resistance housing foundations in their communities because they were the ones who were getting affected. And also uh, one report said that in Sudan, uh, the f f female farmers like improved food securities in the communities because they know what is happening. They are the ones live audience who are being affected because of climate change. And, you know, there are a lot of, you know, youth movements and like, you know, uh, for example, the global climate strike were that Greta like initiated the sunrise movement is led by a woman and you know there are a lot of successful examples and if women are given the chance in the policy making they, that they can bring something which is actually uh, implementable and it is even proven that like women have, have that power and the capacity 
to you know act um, and step um, you know towards achieving the global climate justice uh, when given opportunity so yeah that's that's what i think like women are not getting enough opportunities and enough uh, you know space uh, to get involved in policy making and decision making and which is very necessary at this context because the crisis is like in front of us and we need to act now um, to like you know uh, face the consequences of the climate change so yeah of course uh, this is also your your uh, field of expertise julieta so tell us uh, how is it in, in south america absolutely and uh, so this is like gender and yeah like so, how the government is addressing this i think we should start by the basics right because before getting to statistics and numbers the best, and this is an advice, especially shout out for the amazing people on this university that are doing so much, everything that's about divesting. Let's talk about gender perspective, especially when it comes to the climate crisis. If you don't make this crisis something personal, that's not gonna impact people. I wanna ask a question, and need you once again to raise your hands. This is a question especially for the women in, in the room or anybody that, Okay, but especially women in the room. Have you ever feel harassed while staying in a public transportation? In the subway, in the bus? Okay. We're almost everyone, or I think we're all everyone. So what's normally the, the thing we tend to hear from governments or for organizations to have a better, a, a sustainable way of living, right? If you're washing your teeth, don't leave your, the water running, right? If you're gonna take a shower, don't make it longer than three minutes. Instead of using the car, use the public transportation or use a bicycle. So let me ask you something. What if I, I really want to have a more sustainable way of living? I really want to, but I can use the, the bus now because I don't want to, just because I'm scared. Then what? No, that it's really cool that you're work, using money, right, to make uh, elect electric buses, to reduce the gas emissions. That's wonderful. I, I'm really glad. But what happens with us? If we're gonna continue being sexually harassed in Chile, every 14 minutes, a woman is a victim of sexual harassment. I'm not really sure what happens in the U.S. or your country's realities, but this is something worldwide not just for one country in particular. And if we want to have a backup when it comes to science, there's one of my favorite uh, uh, projects called the Drawdown Project that estimates if we gave every single, we give every single woman and girl access to education and family planning, we could reduce up to 105 gigatons of CO2. 105, so we have a solution. Now we've gotta use that and we've gotta implement it as well. And, and just to finish, because I know that we don't have much, much time in Chile, where, what we're doing, uh, we have the immense privilege of having a government, a new government, that really is interesting in, in, in working towards sustainability, working towards a feminist government. That's something that we never, never even dreamed of. <laughs> um, and it's working with NGOs, asking, well, so what's the difference between a woman that lives in the south, center, and northern Chile? they're gonna have the same opportunities. Are they gonna have the same tools? What happens if I'm living in a rural area or urban area, if I'm part of a indigenous community, if I'm a 12-year-old girl or am I an 80-year-old woman? That are the details that are not details to make a difference, and that's called intersectionality. Hilda, you, you are a, a leader in, in climate activism, so what would you say to young people that want to engage in climate activism, uh, but they don't know where to start? Well, it's two way because I've worked with both communities, those that are aware of climate change and those that are not aware of climate change. So if you are aware of climate change, you are prioritized, you already have the priorities. That means you have the information, you have the education, you have uh, some favorable systems. 
and those that uh, sometimes are not aware of climate change are the ones that are repressed the most. That means their security is repressed, their rights are repressed, and they are passing through difficult situations. They sometimes can't afford to get the climate information that they need. So if you are aware of climate change, you know what's happening, then you have the responsibility to do more. That means you live in a community that is climate aware. That means you have systems that have been put in place to support your climate activism. One, you have a voice. Use your voice to represent millions of voices that do not have a platform. Two, you can take these everyday actions, the individual actions, like uh, Julieta mentioned, you know, uh, tighten the tap if you're not using the water. You can you know, write an article to the newspaper about climate change effects. You can rally your government to make uh, better climate policies. Uh, you can educate other people about climate change. You can share your resources with other people that do not know about climate change. Uh, you can use your phone to influence policy to create climate awareness. So these simple tools could be a way of you know, sharing uh, the plight of many stories that wouldn't have come to light. And in most cases, people who are not climate aware, first, it's about knowing what climate change is, what is happening in their communities, and how they can be part of the solution, and how they can also help other people be climate aware. So if you've heard about climate change, you've gotten uh, the priority to, to, to know what is happening in your community. That means you bear the responsibility of telling other people about it. So we always encourage that kind of learning from each other, the peer-to-peer -peer learning, uh, so that to create more awareness. We also do a lot of activities together, such as tree planting. Uh, we do climate debates. We've so far organized uh, 37 climate, um, climate conversation clubs in schools in Uganda. And every time we keep on expanding these uh, projects so that other people can learn from them. We have, uh, we have a, a child to parent uh, education where we, we motivate children or students to talk to their parents because we are from diverse communities. I might know about climate change, my parents may not, but if they are the ones leading the home, then they can, they're in a better position to create, um, you know, move some actions that I made I, as a student, may not have done on my own. So we encourage uh, students to engage with their parents, know what they do, and how they can be able to be part of the solution. And um, we also try to work with local governments to make sure that they, uh, they make, they make uh, policies that are, that are good for the environment. For example, uh, recently we just wrote a letter to our local leaders to ask them uh, to stop uh, to stop the, okay, there's a group of people that use motorcycles. Uh, motorcycles is a kind of transport that is used in Uganda commonly. And there's this group of men that have been washing their motorcycles from the lake shore. So we clean this lake shore every day to preserve and protect the water. So they come from wherever they come and wash their motorcycles from there. So it's pushing our work backwards. So we wrote a letter to local leaders to stop these men from washing their motorcycles from the, uh, from the lake. And right now it's, uh, it's a law. It has been implemented by the local authorities. And if you are caught washing your motorcycle, you will be jailed. So the public knows that this is, uh, this is a natural resource that needs to be protected uh, rather than being destroyed. And many students did not know that they can even influence politics, poli policy in such a way. So we build confidence and empower students to be part of decision making um, you know, spaces and to also know their rights. And when 
uh, I told you earlier that we are fighting uh, Total Energies, which is trying to create, uh, to construct a pipeline in uh, my country. And when there is a paper that the EU Parliament wrote that uh, Total should pause its activities, and it went, it went so viral on social media. So we rallied students to be part of this because they have a voice and it's their future that is going to be impacted the most with the effects from this uh, oil, crude oil pipeline. And we had a protest in the streets and nine of the students were arrested, but it was a way of, um, it was two ways. Some people were demotivated, but some were motivated to do more because that means their voices are being listened to. Even if there's a pressure, but it means you are doing something and you are being, you know, hard. And it built confidence in these students to keep pushing and to, to keep uh, speaking up, to keep standing up for their rights and making uh, people in power know that they have a voice and they need to be listened to. Thanks. That, that takes me to my next question because We know that climate change is already impacting uh, low and medium income countries. Uh, for example, in East Africa, there are 40 million people who are facing food insecurity uh, due to the droughts that are caused by climate change. But while globally 25% of the population uh, is under the age of 15, in Africa, this is 40%. So, Stephanie, what should the rest of the world know about uh, the biggest impacts that youth is facing from climate change? The biggest impact youth face from, cli from climate change is the fact that youth are experiencing a lot of migration because of the impact of climate change around their communities. I remember a story from my community where this young lady, she, we call it in Cameroon, uh, she had to go look for greener pastures because they lived 13 of them in their small room and food couldn't go around. So like when breakfast is cooked or maybe dinner or, so or lunch, the people who are in the house eat up the whole food. So if you weren't there, you won't have food because food is just enough for the person who is present at home. And this is because the crop yields have reduced. In 2010, we had uh, the disappearance of one of our favorite staples, the Ibo Kukuyam, which uh, impacted a lot of uh, um, food security, insecurity issues around Cameroon. And this, when scientists around Cameroon re, uh, brought up, uh, they said this was as a result of acid rain. So this crop was dying naturally, even though everybody was struggling to plant it. And at that season, we had a lot of youth trying to move out of the country. And most of them went to countries like Kuwait, where um, they got involved in prostitution. They got involved in uh, some of them were raped. Some of them had different issues. And, we, and even across, um, there was a case. I'm part of the Youth Against Slavery movement, where we had a case of this young lady who went to Kuwait, and the, one of the reasons she went, she was from Kenya, was because their, com their community was experiencing drought. And she had to go to Kuwait to fend for her family, and she became a victim of um, rape and human trafficking in Kuwait. So um, uh, Rasha Hafa, who is the founder of Youth Against Slavery Movement, she was one of the persons who actually stood up for this young lady until her case was, um, was looked into and she was returned to her country. So this is what happens with young people and more across different parts of, Camer of Africa and Cameroon in particular. And personally, one of the things I've experienced, the challenges I've experienced is sometimes when I go into a community and I'm trying to talk about climate change, influence uh, women to uh, uh, to be empowered in climate leadership. The communities, the men in those communities often look at me as I am frustrated. I, I am a stubborn girl. 
I am disobedient. I don't respect traditions and cultures. And I don't even know where I'm going to. So I've had that several times until there was, you're so young, what, what, what do you think you can teach our community? I am top down on, but one of the things that always uh, makes me to rise is because in the course of being talked down, they realize that I have the knowledge. I am able to bring the change that I promised them I was bringing. And so far, I've been able to work with communities to uh, bring up 20 forest management policies in different communities. I've worked in 162 communities in Cameroon. I've brought influence uh, their local councils to develop 20 forest management policies. And we've planted over 10,000 trees across different regions in Cameroon with the construction of about 30 nurseries. And bringing together uh, in order to make sure that young people are part of the movement. We've also um, worked on uh, organizing programs like modeling for climate change, getting young girls to model for climate change, so they start understanding that they can make use of their own environment without necessarily running out, no matter the challenges that are happening. We don't want to lose people. We don't want to lose lives. We need people to be able to fight the climate crisis. And if you look at the documentary, uh, my documentary on YouTube, African Voices for African Forest, one of the things I mentioned there is when we take care of our environment, we are actually taking care of ourselves. Because any time we get everyone involved in solving the climate crisis at their own levels, it enables them to be able to know that we don't need to run out of this situation. Let's sit here, put our hands on deck, and make sure that we see the solution that we are seeking. And a few months ago, I, before I, 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 was, I came to the US uh, for the Mandela Washington Fellowship, I uh, brought together four communities where they had to play football for trees. These were young men who came together and played football. And within one week, we were able to plant 500 trees in these communities. We had to put a cash price, but we made them to understand it was not about the price. Mm -hmm. The target was the number of trees we had to plant. And they helped us plant those trees in their communities. And the winner, the person who took the trophy, had to plant an extra 100 trees in that community. <laughs> 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 Next effort <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> for the winner. So that, and then um, I, uh, I, I work with children in schools where I use arts, creative arts, as a means to instill in them climate leadership, hmm. train them as climate ambassadors. And I, re I remember one day, and I will always smile whenever I talk about that story, I gave the kids an assignment like, go home and write a letter to your future. And one of them came with a letter that inspired me. I wept in the class because she said, one day when I grow up, I want to be like Auntie Iwi. I want to talk about climate change. I want to go to the university. I want to study climate change. I want to tell my, my dog. I mean, that was the funny part. I want to tell my dog about climate change. <laughs> 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 so I felt really inspired and I kept that letter. When you come to my desk, you will see that letter on it <laughs> because that inspired me. I had felt like it was a waste of time talking about climate change to people within my area because everybody seemed to see climate change as politics. Mm -hmm. But when they began, uh, when these children began capturing it and understanding what the whole thing was, it made me to understand that I am not raising a generation that will not know what they are doing. I'm raising a generation that will stand up for what they want and create the change that they want to create. Two times we've had the first climate parade in Cameroon. And this took place um, early this year and a few weeks ago before I came here, where I brought together these children in, from the school that I'm working with to parade for climate change. With their artwork, they went around the street talking and shouting and screaming to their voices on climate change. Mm -hmm. We went to the communities, uh, community palace and brought together their parents, their teachers, the chiefs, and let the children display and talk their poems, rhymes, and everything that they had learned during our eco clubs. And this has been like this. The families were impressed. The communities were impressed. And I was really impressed at the point, too, because we, um, Cameroon is facing political situations now. And having parades on the street 
It's not what is being approved. But we were so, so lucky that the CEO of my town was, he was taken away by the concept and he decided to offer us a permit to run that climate parade in Cameroon, in my, in, in my, in my community. And this reached over a hundred parents on one day. So this helps me to understand we are solving the problem of youth being affected mm -hmm. with the climate crisis. Because if we don't start young, we might still be talking the same thing we are talking now 20 years later. Mm. But if we are able to impact them today, then we have solved the problem that, just imagine in two years, I've been able to work with 500 children. And if all of the 500 children don't talk about climate change, I am certain 100 will talk about climate change. And if I have 100 climate leaders, sincere climate leaders, growing up from the age of five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, I believe that in the nearest future, Cameroon will have a balanced climate system. Mm -hmm. And I can't wait to be part of that future. That was very inspiring. Um, you, you said that climate change is not, or not politics, but unfortunately we need to talk about politics and that takes me to COP27, um, that um, yeah, it's one of the most important uh, climate conferences and it's politics. So Monica, you were talking about it before in your introduction and I want to know um, whether you think youth consider the outcome of COP27 a success? And um, concretely, when we talk about loss and damage, um, whether is it enough? And what youth has to say about the agreement on loss and damages, the fund? Thank you. Um, yeah, like, um, yeah, as a, one of the major outcomes of COP27, like there was a historic um, agreement for the fun, fund of loss and damage. Uh, for you know climate vulnerable communities, but like what is it's half done until implementation. So the impl until until and unless like the implementation is done, so we we, we are like uh, usually limited on our words and not in action. So yeah, like like let's hope uh, positive and also like you know the conference itself offered a lot of um, opportunities to act on achieving you know the target of you know the limiting the global temperature uh, like to 1.5 degree or below it but you know it failed to deliver what the science tells us and what is needed to be done like we need to declare climate emergency we are at the stage where the climate crisis like i mentioned earlier crisis is already and we need to act as um, you know act now and like you know um, you know like looking at the evidences like we have a lot of pieces of evidences that disaster is happening climate due disaster we like uh, for example uh, the, there was the extreme flood in pakistan which affected a lot of communities in that area in nepal as well there are a lot of you know irregular weather patterns like during the monsoon season there are like like if we look at the history of past 5 uh, years like there are a lot of landslide and flooding patterns where like you know a lot of food uh you know post harvest food is being destroyed a lot of communities are facing different you know mountainous reason communities are facing glacier lake outburst flood um in tarai the there are you know new invasive species are being introduced so like we need to you know have like cop cop had this opportunity where we could have you know uh, achieved more but uh, like the similar cases to the disaster there were there was a lot of pressure to respond to such disaster and you know the mitigation part was somehow uh, missing in my perspective and um, also about the climate finance and the mitigation part was kind of disappointing we are at the stage where we need to uh, declare climate emergency and act accordingly uh, what the sciences tell us so yeah let's hope positive and let's uh, hope that you know in future uh, youth's demands will be addressed um, more seriously and in the decision making ta uh, table youths and indigenous communities will get to share their stories more so that uh, you know the policymakers can like you know design policies according to the uh, 
the facts that science is showing and the evidences are showing. So yeah, that's what uh, I think uh, that COP27 was not a success, but somehow like uh, something is better than nothing for me. So yeah, it is good that, you know, uh, the countries have decided to fund for loss and damage, uh, but yeah, implementation is still necessary. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, climate finance, financing is so related to, to climate justice. And since uh, there are no questions from the audience, I'm, I, I will just come up with my own. Um, Hila, um, I, I wanted to know um, what needs to change to achieve climate justice? Well, um, I will echo this because we've been saying it for quite a while that um, climate justice is intersectional. It has a lot combined together. And we cannot achieve climate justice without addressing other uh, challenges like social justice, gender justice, and the rest. But um, what really uh, needs to be done is, one, if we have political will to actually take on uh, the necessary steps and the necessary actions that are needed to combat climate change, then we can achieve climate justice. We need systematic changes. We need, um, we last, on Friday we were saying that we need a paradigm shift and that needs political will to be able to have that. So we need political will, but also we need voices of those who are directly impacted by the effects of climate change to be center and uh, front in these negotiating rooms. So we need to listen to voices of youth and women in order to combat climate change because they can draw on their experiences to offer solutions. So we cannot have um, one of the population part of the population left on the sidelines if we are looking for a solution because these are the most impacted group of people so they have to be part of the solution that will be thank you Hila. um there were actually questions from the audience but uh, i didn't they didn't come to me so i'm i i want to read one of them um I'm here with two, uh, with two second graduates. They noticed that you are only girls on the stage. Bravo. What inspirational advice can you offer them right now? Um, they both, both came because they said they love nature during recess. They both pick up and, uh, garbage and see protect mother nature. What, what, um, what inspirational advice could you say to young, to young uh, girls here in the audience today? So, so Julieta, do you want oh, to, to go ahead? Right. Um, ooh, I'm going. I'm going to give you something practical because sometimes we get in like yeah. big, really big terms. It's really hard to get in the ground. First of all, and it might seem obvious, but it's fundamental. Do not work alone. Never. Ever. We need each other. We live in an individualist society, and we just can't take it anymore. And. Um, you no, know, I've been reading uh, this, this, this couple of days a book called How to Deal with Difficult People when it comes to the climate <laughs> crisis, because we all deal with a mean yeah. colleague, a mean boss, a male friend, whatever. And it's so important to understand when it comes to climate crisis, how to get a step farther from recycling or, or like the everyday things that you can mm -hmm. do, right, in, in a daily basis. So, for example, when I have to deal with politicians that are not necessarily happy with what I say or what I do, I'm just gonna leave it like that. Because <laughs> I'm just a little bit harder than that. We need to find, even if I don't like the person, we need to find a common ground. For example, the most important thing for you could be the economy, right? That's so important. How can you continue building your economy if you don't have clean water? If your people is dying? If your land is destroyed? Those are the things based on data, scientists, but also a, that's what I tried to say based on a personal crisis. 
And I'm going to ask once again to show me something, people. I know I'm doing this a lot, but I do I really need it. Show me your phones. I, maybe your genius using it while we're talking, I'm going to be really offended. Uh, so I'm, I'm not even going to guess. I know that every single one of you has a phone. Yeah. If you had a phone, you have access to a supercomputer. How do you get involved when to get to know what hap what's happening in Afghanistan, in Venezuela, in Ukraine, Ukraine? Ukraine, that's what you say, right? Because you have a phone. Because you have access to information. You have access to technology. Use that. I know it's hard sometimes, but what are you do? You young people, young activists, doing right now is make this information that's always in the scientific community more accessible, more friendly, more close, like closer to, easier to read. In that, it's life changing. You know, and I'm finishing with this. Uh, I had the privilege last year to work on something, rewrite the new constitution of Chile that didn't end as end as out. I would like it to end, but it was all thanks to get informed, get educated, and ask for changes, especially coming from young people. So it's possible, and I'm saying this by experience. Um, th there is another question that is uh, very interesting. It's from a service teacher. Um, she says, how do you recommend we teach woman, women empowerment to combat climate change? Maybe Iwi, you want to come up with this one? Well, I like, thank you. I really like that question. And uh, I think uh, what, uh, I was in COP27, and uh, one of the things I was trying to, I was advocating for was um, nature-based solutions, climate finance towards nature-based solutions, because uh, that is what I do in Cameroon. I focus on nature-based solutions with women. And I empower women on mushroom cultivation, snow farming, beekeeping. I teach them how to plant trees, grow trees. And I'm also building their capacities on micro-enterprise development. And when uh, I won the UN Agora Award, and they asked me, what, were you going to, what are you going to do with this award? And I told them, when I was working in these communities, these women, I listened to what they wanted. They mentioned, before uh, I went to uh, COP27, I organized the Sink Our Carbon Workshop. Sink Our Carbon Workshop brought together different stakeholders, different stakeholders across uh, the community forest where I work in. And we had discussions on what should be done. And we had people from all categories, from the regional levels to the community levels, and we had to bring the community people to talk about their own issues and provide solutions to their own problems. And surprisingly enough, these three communities told us what they wanted. And the, uh, what I remember one of uh, the communities said, or yeah, two communities said, um, what, because in that community, one of them, we are teaching them on snail farming. So they said, our snails are ready, we've already started harvesting. But now, we want to expand our snails and get more snail pens and do our work better. And that was their proposal, and I made sure I recorded it. Another community said, we're already having a nursery because we just planted a 2,000 uh, capacity tree nursery with them of fruit trees so they could grow the fruit trees and in the long run sell it and get money from it to send their children to school and also support their husbands back at home and uh, in, uh, get micro um, credits for themselves. So um, they said, now what we need, I was shocked to my core because they brought up a solution that wasn't in my head. They said what we need is a solar-powered nursery and a solar-powered borehole. Mm -hmm. So this, and I had to prop, and why do you need this? They said, we go to the farms and we come back really late. It's difficult for us to take care of the nurseries during the day. So since we have more time in the evenings, we don't have electricity. We think that a solar-powered nursery will enable us to have electricity so we can, and a solar-powered borehole will enable us to get water so we can water the plants in the nursery even in the evenings and we are able to go ahead with what we are doing. So it's as easy as let them tell you what they want. Don't go into the community and impose 
on the community because, hey, I'm a climate expert. I want to tell you what you want because I know the problem you have more than you do. I know that this is that. You don't come into somebody's house and tell them there are problems. They know there are problems. What they just need is resources to help them solve their problems. And that is what we have been missing out on for a very long time. And I think it's time that, that is why at COP, I kept insisting we need to give climate finance. It was an African COP, like it was termed. Mm -hmm. So I said, give Africans resources to solve African problems. When you go to the Southern Americas, give Southern Americas the resources to solve their problems. Mm -hmm. We don't come into their communities and impose that we want to solve these problems. And uh, um, before I want to end this, I, uh, I, I would like to say climate education is very essential if we have to solve these problems. Let us not hide climate change using climate jargons. Mm -hmm. Like, what is, what is loss and damage? What is reparations? What is mitigation and adaptation? Yeah. Let's use the simple words that these people can understand, indigenous communities can understand. I was listening to Vice President Argos' speech at uh, COP27, and he said 14% of climate finance is amongst all the climate finance, 14% is sent to Africa, and only 1% is sent to indigenous communities. So we see the mess that we are in. And we need, is, that is because we, we have brought up so much climate jargon that has mixed up the minds of these people. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, why one of the things I am working on, I'm actually doing my PhD now. Making things simple. No? <laughs> yes. I'm actually doing my PhD now. And I'm, uh, I, had, I have a climate curriculum that I've been using to work with the children at the Echo Club. But I'm working at uh, 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 developing this climate curriculum so that it can be implemented from a nursery level, from a kindergarten level, right up to the university. My intention was to do a PhD in climate change. But when I got to the university, there was no course in climate change. And I had to repeat in natural resource management that I did in my master's. So I just got, in, uh, uh, got into the PhD program this, program this year, but I hope that by the time I'm done with that PhD, there'll be a climate change curriculum that will be accepted in my nation that can be used from a kindergarten level right up to the bachelor's degree level and why not PhD level? That's great. Thank um, you. We, are, we have time yeah. for one more question and there's one in the audience. Okay, let's, let's take the one from the audience. Suzanne Gase, I'm from down the road in Arvada, Colorado. And a quick question for the Ugandan panelist. I'm dying to know if you had a chance to explain to your grandmother what really caused the drought so she knew that the gods weren't angry at you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we had a beautiful conversation. I explained to her that uh, these were not the gods. It was something called climate change. And then she said something that is a bit off. She's like, I knew the whites brought it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry for her perspective. She didn't really go to school, so. She, but in a way, she was right, because this was caused by the, when you look at the uh, global gas emissions, most of them are produced by Global North countries, and they have a very big role that they have played. But I explained to her that not the whites, but I explained to her how the companies work and how this comes about, the emissions, how they come to affect or to change the seasons and like everything in the process, like the gas emissions, changing of seasons, crops dry and you know, everything. So she understood. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I think we can go for closing remarks and, and final thoughts. And I was inspired by one of the questions that was in the app. Um, and maybe we can briefly uh, talk about it as closing remarks. How can we bridge the gap in the conversation between older generations and the youth um, who will be most impacted by climate change? Monica, would you like to start on this one? Let's keep um, um, 
yeah like uh, like uh, it's an example like i visited to a rural community and like i met a 72 year old man there who has been like living there for like you know more than um 60 years uh, and it is one of the most vulnerable uh, uh, like like area in, in nepal because it is one like highly affected due to the consequences and climate induced disasters it is highly affected area like due to earthquake which happened in 2015 so yeah he, uh, we are having some connection problems he had a lot of experiences and he was aware like monica we cannot uh, we cannot yeah, hear you this all due to climate change but he has he had was interviewing him he said that like he knew that it was hard hello uh yeah there are some connection problems monica um apologies i, I Come back yeah, let's try uh, later. Hilna, briefly, um, how we can bridge the gap between the older and younger generation on well, climate change? Yeah, uh, we can bridge the gap by uh, addressing the long challenges that have been between the two generations, I think, and also realizing and respecting that youth have a role to play in combating climate change and that the responsibility does not only lie uh, with the youth but also with the older generation and um, respecting uh, that they also have the knowledge to contribute in combating climate change and also uh, working together, like uh, Julieta said, we cannot work alone. So if we can uh, address these challenges, we can be able to work alone and that will bridge the gap between uh, these. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Julieta. You're gonna have to, excuse me, but I'm, I'm gonna answer the question, but I need to say something, because these are closing remarks. If I don't say it now, I'm not gonna say it later. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm kind of going to ask the question, but the best thing we can do right now is find a common ground. So I'm going to ask you, don't do it now, but do it later. <laughs> search, use your phone, and search about something called loss and damage. That's one of the most important things that we need right now, especially for the Global South, if we want to solve the climate crisis. It's about a fund, like funding the most affected countries, like the most affected regions by the climate crisis, by the global north. And normally people tend to say, like, oh, but how are we gonna, gonna, how are we gonna fund another, another country if I'm already having so much trouble in my own country, right? And, and that's valid. Always question yourselves. All that, that, that countries are wonderful when it comes to sustainability, that are carbon neutral, that it's amazing. But where are they taking the minerals from? Where are taking the resources? We can't move forward if we don't get that funding. And just to finish, I want to quote a wonderful activist that I truly, truly inspires me. That's called Vanessa Nakate. She's also from Uganda, right? Mm -hmm. That basically you can't, normally we talk about adaptation and mitigation, right? You can't adapt to poverty. You can't adapt to starvation. You can't adapt to something that already collapsed. So we need to be resilient. And to be resilient is not just money to buy a solar panel. It's to have the opportunity to, to keep living and keep having opportunities. So always question that. And please, afterwards, search about loss and damage, because it's a really important topic that's going to be a breaking point for the next COP. Thank you. Evie, uh, something on uh, how to break the, the gap. How to break the gap before I first want to thank uh, the CEO, um, uh, Buddha, and the UN Human Rights for giving us this opportunity as young people to be on this panel. I think uh, in other programs, you see just maybe very elderly people who have had 40 years, 60 years of experience and know everything about climate change, and they are talking about it. but. This is already one of the ways to bridge the gap, hmm. bringing us young people to pass on our knowledge 
making us feel like experts, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and giving us that privilege to tell our stories to the world. I, know, I can imagine how many people are listening and watching us now they, without an age distinction, either young or elderly or uh, LGBTQ, indigenous people, high class, low class, like every set of people is present watching this event and participating in it. That is a step to build a gap. And then trust young people with climate finance. <laughs> Please trust young people with climate finance. Yes, we know young people are very agile. Some might not be very, <laughs> <laughs> some might not be very responsible. But please, those who have shown responsibility, trust them with climate finance and believe that they are able to do the work they have promised to do. And also, when we are trusting them with climate finance, make sure that there are provisions for monitoring and evaluation. Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes, we support projects, but we forget the monitoring part. Hmm. And when projects are not monitored, they tend to fail. And we start next year all over, repeating the same projects. But if we had provided space for monitoring and evaluation, we might not be repeating the projects. Accountability is so important, so important. Monica, let's try again. Final remarks briefly, please. We are over time. Um, I'm audible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you, and apologies for the uh, interruption earlier. So yeah, what I would like to uh, like end this discussion with is that like you know you have to listen to the elderly. Uh, they have experience of you know more than 50, 60 years, and they have uh, they are the ones who have actually faced the changes. Who are like knowledgeable enough to give you um, all the background history that like they have been seeing. So like listen to them, listen to the elderly and process it, analyze it, how uh, the changes have been and pass it to the younger generation because they are the ones who are, are like, you know, like, taking over so we have to you know act as a knowledge gap and act uh, you know as the resource person for the younger generation so that they can act and to create a more sustainable uh, future for themselves and for everyone else so yeah that's uh, my final remarks that I would like to see thank you Monica from my side I would like just can okay I just add okay thing I forgot um, I think personally I'm a product of mentorship and one of the ways to bridge that gap is the elder people to, to give a chance to mentor mm. the younger generation. Yeah, so I think if we have mentors, like I'm, I'm a younger person, I need some other person who is older to mentor me, uh, and then I mentor another person who is younger than me, we are going to be solving a great deal. Yeah, that's a good way to bridge the gap. I, from my side, I want to say that I think it's so important that, that we give the space to young people to share their ideas and their, uh, their, and their energy, uh, but also to involve them in, 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 in the discussion and in, and in policy making. Um, so I'm, I'm so thankful that uh, CU Boulder and the UN made this discussion possible and this topic part of the agenda. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Please welcome UN Human Rights Officer Teresa Arneson to share some concluding remarks. What an amazing panel. Thank you. I want to start out by saying thank you to everyone. I want to thank our partners, University of Colorado Boulder, for the amazing work that they have done to make this summit a reality. I want to thank our partner in the right here, right now, Global Climate Alliance, for connecting us and starting this work more than a year ago. I want to thank the students, the volunteers, and the university staff who have been working so hard to make this all happen. I'm so proud to be here, um, so inspired by these three days of discussions with 
amazing panelists, and I have to say also amazing moderators. Thank you so much, everyone. I want to just briefly recap some of the things we've heard because I found so many of these discussions to be so, not just interesting, but really moving. Um, and that's why we were here. That's why we're here in the first place. Uh, we had Sheila Watt-Cloutier who spoke about how climate change impacts Inuit Arctic communities and how that adds to the historical discrimination and marginalization that they have faced. I don't know about you, but I really struggled to keep my tears back as she started out just telling us historical facts before even getting to climate change. Um, Kira Sherwood O'Regan talked about how capitalism, colonialism, sexism, ableism, all of these structures contribute to undermine her community ways of life and also in that way making them more vulnerable to climate change. I found that really powerful. Um, and it's true that we've heard a lot of stories about impacts and vulnerabilities. But I think that from these women, we also heard a lot about agency and empowerment, and that indigenous peoples, they, they hold many of the keys that we need to unlock the climate crisis. We had Selina Leem and Hilda Flavia Nakabuye speak about their lived experiences, both facing and really fighting climate change impacts in the Marshall Islands, in Uganda, um, being questioned by police, going to jail for speaking out about climate change and human rights. Um, that's quite different from my daily work. I sit in an office in Geneva, I speak about the same things, but I don't face the same risks. So I really want to pay tribute to these activists, human rights defenders, environmental human rights defenders. <laughs> I want to pay tribute to the activists that are here with us as well, um, making us walk the talk for being here for three days and reminding us that participation is absolutely key to climate action. Um, Mary Robinson, she talked about layers of injustice, and I think that's been a recurring theme these days. Um, but she also talked about the need for women-led climate justice, and that's what we heard from the panel right before me as well, the gendered impacts of climate, of climate change. And um, we had Yeb Sano, who told us about bringing us back to the days um, of super typhoon Hanai, Haiyan in the Philippines, and the absolutely amazing and courageous work that the Human Rights Commission did in their inquiry looking into the responsibility of carbon mayors for bringing climate change about in the first place. So I also want to pay tribute to the work of Seb and his colleagues in the Philippines, which is another country in which undertaking human rights work puts you at great risk. Um, today we had Kumi Naido speak to us about the importance of participatory climate action, reminding us that building bridges is the only way to have these voices heard where they need to be heard. Um, he spoke to us from afar, but um, I, I, I think he moved not just me, but many others in this room and, and hopefully many of the people who are watching online. I really want to thank him for that powerful keynote. Um, we also had a local track of the summit, which was very interesting to follow. I think the only unfortunate thing was that sometimes things went on in parallel, but just learning about um, local businesses, but also industry leaders from outside of here, um, talking about the work that they do, both to counter climate change and to work towards the just transition. I was really um, key to have those voices with us. We need, what do we need? We need governments, we need businesses to carry the burden along with the indigenous communities who are at the front line. We need the duty bearers to carry the burden along with climate activists because they face risks for their work, um, which is basically a very basic human rights, participating in decision making. States and businesses can work together and cut the missions. They need to do it now. You need to scale up climate adaptation and you need to provide sufficient funding so that loss and damage um, is addressed in the most vulnerable communities. I think we live in a time where fossil fuel companies have never made greater profits um, and the harms of their actions have never been better documented. Uh, and that's quite a paradox. I think that this is a case for regulation, um, increased taxation, and it's a matter of climate justice, very simply. Um, yet we see that these companies 
they continue to lobby against regulation and they continue to receive government subsidies. Um, there's no justice in a world where it is the people that are paying while the polluters are profiting. I hope that this comes out very strongly from the summits, looking at you guys. Um, this summit has really put the lived experiences of the people of the forefront of the climate crisis at the center. Um, and I think that's what we were hoping to do in the first place. Uh, but it also brought together both right holders and duty bearers around the same table, around many, many of the same tables. Um, and this is really what we need. We need collective action. We need to build those bridges um, and work together. We also saw really uh, the key role of education and educational institutions in doing this. And that's why it's so welcome to, to hold this summit at, at your university. Um, I think that's what's, what's left. We need to unite. We need to stand together to continue promoting human rights based climate action. Um, that's what the summit is about. This is what the human rights climate commitments coming out of the summit is about. Um, and I hope that you will take with you some of the inspiration, despair and anger and excitement that I at least felt during these last three days and, and take that with you in everything you do. Um, the Human Rights Office is really looking forward to working with you, supporting you in this work, continuing this work after the summit. Um, we're working to promote the right to health environment and that includes a safe and stable climate to become a reality for everyone, everywhere. So thank you. <laughs>